Okay, I believe we're recording. Welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about large sites today. I'm Ted Gifford. I've been with WebFirst for 16 years, uh, which I believe is probably all the advertisement that I need to do. Uh, but if you want to stop by our table in the Hilton, it's uh, right outside the elevators on the second floor. Uh, so yeah, large sites and small bites is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, this is everything that you need to know uh, about the talk. You can leave after this slide if you want to. Uh, it's all about the layers. Uh, so we can have our cake and eat it too. We're going to go through some sort of gray, boring PowerPoint slides with a few arrows drawn on them. Uh, make cheesy jokes. We're in the middle of that. Uh, we're going to unearth ancient artifacts uh, of our websites and I'll spare you the other jokes. So what is a large site? Uh, it probably has lots of content. Uh, maybe it has many content types, integrations with external systems, and uh, another very important factor for us is that it'll have a multitude of stakeholders to go along with the content. We were migrating from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, uh, and then eventually to Drupal 9, uh, and you could use these techniques for any web application. Uh, HTTP is going to be a theme that runs through this entire talk. For our purposes, we'll break the migrations down into three buckets. Uh, the complete or one-shot migration, where you do a lot of preparation in the before times, in the during times, you sweat and you're very worried, but you've prepared, hopefully, you do your validations after you migrate the content, and then afterwards everything is served from the new site, old site is no more. If you have subsites, uh, multiple Drupal instances, or maybe you have different technologies in your stack, you might be able to break that migration down and do a partial or phased migration uh, where we repeat the above process. Our incremental migration has much <coughs> smaller chunks. Um, we still do our preparation and validation uh, more frequently, but uh, in smaller chunks. So for those of you that this didn't quite make the concept clear, uh, I have avatars for you to identify with. Uh, maybe you are Superwoman, who's going to leap a tall mountain, or I guess that's a plateau. Um, in any case, uh, she'll do it in one bound. Running Man can make a series of hurdles and get there, uh, and our pedestrian is just out for a leisurely stroll <coughs> up an incremental ramp. That's probably clear to everybody. We're all, yeah, but I had to make another slide anyway because you were looking for pachyderms and their consumption, no doubt. Uh, so we can eat the whole elephant. We can break it down into some big chunks or maybe bite-sized pieces. Thank you for dealing with those three slides. Okay, so what makes an incremental migration different uh, is besides the size of the increments is that both versions of the site remain active at the same time. Uh, content migrated to the new version masks or decides which content is going to get served from the old version. There are some corollaries. You have to keep the same theme, otherwise if somebody's bouncing back and forth between the sites, uh, they will be very confused. Uh, you'll serve all your 404s from the old site, not none from the new site by default, unless you do some other interventions and you have to remove content from both sites. Again, absent other interventions. We talked about a proxy migration back in the title, uh, you may have recalled. So the new site is proxying content to the old site. That's a lot like your uh, CDN, your Varnish, your Akamai, your Cloudflare. It's just another layer, right? So we're going to insert our new site into the existing stack. Uh, this is the, uh, the Swiss cheese model of migrations, um, which is, of course, a uh, treasured cultural touchstone that we all share now. Um, the HTTP requests are virus particles, and they're going to uh, <laughs> go through the caching layers if it's not there, and go through the new site, hit the old site, and um, the old site will uh, serve up the content. And that means our smallest migration increment is a single web page or single HTTP request. Just 
to break that down again, uh, the user's browser sends the request to the CDN. If it's cached, it comes back. If it was not cached, it would fall through to the new site, get served from there. If it was migrated, or if it was not migrated, we go back to the old site. So, uh, most of you uh, that are developers or perhaps have had Drupal sites have been through a migration at some point. Um, so why not just do a full migration, which we do on a lot of sites. Um, obviously we talked about the size of the site, uh, but some other considerations are that uh, you might have big differences in your Drupal versions. Uh, the APIs change, Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, big change. Um, but even, you know, later versions could have significant changes as well. Uh, if you have a lot of content, you're doing a lot of analysis, doing that all at once and up front uh, is, is a big lift. Uh, a lot of approvals. And uh, all this is tied in to the correlation between the size of your increment and uh, the risk that you are incurring. Uh, this uh, Gartner uh, quadrant diagram um, I uh, just made up really quickly, but it's totally scientific. Uh, you can trust anything that you see in a chart. Um, but it, there's a correlation between increment size and risk. Okay, uh, there's a bunch of moving parts here. Um, I see some of you moving. You are people, you move, that's good. Uh, the Migrate API moves stuff for us. We have functionality code on our site, which as engineers, we say those are the moving parts of the site a lot of the time. Uh, we are going to talk about the workspaces module, which is an experimental module you may or may not have heard of. Uh, and then, of course, our proxy itself, which is going to be middleware, uh, which is another fun concept you get with Drupal 8 and later. OK, so people move. I, I told my kids that I would not dance or um, dab or do anything like that. I'll give myself a little micro dab. There we go. Um, the uh, the stakeholders, uh, you know, they, they have conflicting priorities. Uh, you know, different schedules that they have to take care of, and it can if you have enough of them, it might feel like herding cats. Uh, the gummies that are here will tell us that it's nothing like herding vendors. Uh, we hear you. It's all about hurting. It is. It is. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, your migration team uh, also has people on it, uh, unless you've replaced them entirely uh, with ChatGPT now. Um, there have been a couple of talks about doing that, I believe. Here, that's right. Uh, so, all of us are, are humans, and we do our best to estimate, you know, ahead of time. Uh, but. There's, there's a chance that uh, we're going to have to adapt you know, and change our approach, right? Uh, so this works well with an agile uh, workflow. Let's talk about the Migrate API a little bit. Uh, there have been other talks on this, even at the ScovCon, quite a few, I think. Uh, but it's an ETL process, extract, transform, load. In Migrate API, we call that source, process, and destination. Uh, you could be migrating nodes, custom blocks, files, media, uh, a number of different things, even configuration uh, sometimes. Uh, but most of those are orthogonal to the incremental concept. Uh, if you have a plugin to migrate articles, a source or a destination uh, plugin, it's going to migrate articles from the about section and from the research section of your site uh, just to give an example and we want to do one of those sections at a time not both so um, those of you that appreciated the choice of orthogonal as a word um, you're not normal <laughs> my uh, my presentation with uh, you know just all math jokes that's tomorrow you can come back for that uh, and there's another dab. Look at that. Okay. All right. So uh, we are uh, dealing with non-content uh, code uh, as our moving parts. We talked about the APIs changing. Drupal moves your cheese. Um, these are all things that you need to, uh, you know, 
consider when you're doing your migration, and it could be a lot to do up front all at once. If you can, um, of course, you're, you're never going to do it all in a single sprint, but if you can actually get some of this stuff published and, and, and migrated and out there, um, you know, it makes the, uh, the final migration a lot smaller, right? Allows your team to focus on one thing at a time. Uh, we have special pages and square and scare quotes uh, here. Those, uh, you know, 12 layers deep in the sitemap, uh, inline JavaScript or, or styles or something like that, uh, that hopefully you haven't run into in your own migrations, but uh, it could be nice to take those uh, one at a time and, and work through them. All right, workspaces. Uh, has anybody here used workspaces? Got a few, excellent. Uh, so it is an experimental module. Um, uh, this is the one that's in Drupal core, not the contrib uh, version workspace. Yes, uh, naming things is hard. Yes. Uh, it's a <laughs> common theme. Um, so they allow you to preview and publish uh, all the associated content at once. Uh, but uh, th they use revisions, uh, just like content moderation or, or translation, uh, content moderation, you know, a draft, pre publish, uh, or different languages. Um, but by publishing all the content at once or previewing all the content at once, uh, it gives you a little bit more control and it gives a, a nice user interface uh, for content managers uh, as you're doing your migration. Uh, so it only works for authenticated users out of the box. So we adapted this for anonymous users. Uh, not going to go into that at all, really, but guess what? More middleware. Common theme. All right. You don't have to use workspaces. Uh, maybe experimental modules aren't for you. You're in a high security uh, place or whatever. Um, but uh, we found it very helpful. Uh, unsurprisingly, Drupal requests or, or HTTP requests, uh, they move as well. Uh, we talked already about the layers of HTTP proxies. Uh, we're going to repeat that theme here uh, with middleware. Middleware is another series of layers. Uh, hopefully not turtles, they need to be fast. Uh, turtles all the way down? No. Um, it's cheetahs all the way down. Uh, so it's the Swiss cheese model, yes. Uh, we're adding a new layer, our proxy. Uh, it's pretty easy to do because of all the excellent engineering that Drupal Core uh, has done based on Stack PHP and Symfony. Uh, and we want to be early, but not too early in the, uh, in the pipeline there. Uh, we start with content type negotiation, reverse proxy support for some headers and things like that. If you're using the page cache module, you'd want that to run first so that if you've got it cached, you can uh, avoid even doing any extra work. Uh, and then here's our migration proxy. So the concept, uh, we'll get into a little bit more in a minute, but first, many of you developers here are thinking you're using Drupal PHP as a proxy. That is a terrible idea. Uh, and you are correct 100%. Uh, each PHP FPM process can take up maybe 100 megabytes of memory, just as a rough estimate. Uh, PHP is single-threaded and blocking by default. For the non-developers, that means it only handles one request at a time. Uh, that's single-threaded. Blocking means if I make a request to an external resource, like the database, or another website, perhaps the old Drupal site that we're migrating away from, uh, the new site, the PHP uh, process, will just wait and do nothing, nothing useful, um, until that response comes back. Uh, proxies <coughs> need to handle lots of requests all at once. Okay, and even if we, you know, for all the developers, there's a few of you out here I saw, uh, you, uh, you know of some libraries that are, you know, uh, allow making parallel requests and stuff like that, but we're still dealing with the F in PHP FPM, which is fast CGI, which is based on the older CGI protocol, which is not, you know, allowing interleaved requests like P uh, HTTP2. Uh, so, so we're stuck, uh, and we're not going to be doing our proxying through PHP. So we use our middleware to make a quick decision. Does our slice of cheese have a hole in it? After we make that quick decision, 
then we kick it back to the web server. In our case, it was Nginx. Uh, you can do this with Apache, I think, uh, but I believe it would be a little bit more involved. Um, so if you were going to try this, you might want to get some Nginx on board. Uh, all right, so yes, very good at doing its job. Um, that did not do anything. What did I click? Hmm. Let's hope that problem does not continue. Okay. So yes, the concept is that our middleware is going to return a special status code, uh, which we configure Nginx to look for. If it sees it, it'll proxy to the D7 site. Uh, takes about four lines of config. Uh, there's some other details uh, that you might want to take care of there, uh, but then you go from serving uh, one process per, uh, per worker PHP to 1024 per worker process in Nginx uh, in its default configuration. I had to make that PHP bar a little bit bigger so you could see it. All right, uh, any, any questions, anybody, everybody keeping up so far? Well, I mean, so this answers the performance question of why don't you just let it fall through in 404 on the proxy side and then just redirect. Right. And the answer is because you got high traffic. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, uh, although um, we did actually, for authenticated users, which I'll get to in a later slide, uh, we did proxy that through PHP uh, because there's so many fewer of those and we wanted to do a little markup tweak. Um, and they're also getting a performance hit anyway because they're authenticated. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, you also may have some security concerns about this. Uh, HTTP proxies. Uh, have a vulnerability that uh, was, you know, bigger uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, showing my age here, but um, request smuggling allows an attacker to send a malformed HTTP request with conflicting headers, um, where they say, you know, it's this size in one header, but then secretly they add other stuff in there. And different layers of your stack, because you're dealing with Nginx and you know, varnish, and maybe if we're passing it to the old site, it's Apache, right? All these different uh, parts of the stack might deal with invalid headers in different ways. Request smuggling could bypass authentication or allow reflected cross-site scripting, a lot of other fun stuff. Um, so, usually requires a post request. So, in our case, we just said, we're gonna stick with get requests, keep it simple. Um, that means all your web forms and uh, any other post requests, we split at a higher level, at a load balancer from the old stack to the new stack. <coughs> so, a little extra wrinkle there. Uh, you might have denial of service opportunities. You were adding a little extra work. You know, now we're making a request from the old site to the new site. Want to make sure that you have a CDN and a web application firewall in front anyway. And of course, uh, when you have more places to enter information and manage information, there's a chance that the content team uh, could accidentally publish something at the wrong time. A press release, something about litigation, uh, all of a sudden you're moving the markets and uh, nobody is happy. So uh, that's a security concern, um, premature information disclosure. Okay, back to the middleware, my favorite part. Uh, so we, we need it to be very fast. And um, that's going to involve tuning it to your specific site. If you're serving mostly content, that means you probably want to check for a content alias first. That's going to be your fastest, most likely to, to hit you know, uh, and get a response back. If, on the other hand, you weren't dealing with mostly content or you were using views to surface your content or some other route, uh, you would want to you know, check that first, right? You want to make sure you Play the odds, essentially, right, in your middleware and save every cycle that you can. There's other common performance uh, you know, concerns like limiting the size of your queries and responses. Uh, and once you've gotten far enough along in your migration, you'll want to have a configuration that you pass in maybe via an environment variable uh, to the middleware that allows you to exclude entire sections of the site you know, from this consideration. You don't have to do any queries, right? You know already 
the about section is completely migrated. We're not ever going to look at the old site. Uh, interestingly, you're not going to integrate with the migrate API in your middleware. That's because the rest of the Drupal stack doesn't talk to the migrate API. Why would you? Uh, so you will just check for you know the specific things that the rest of the stack might look for. And of course, you're going to benchmark. Uh, you want to make sure that even if you're you know pretty sure you're being fast, you you want to know for sure. Okay, uh, that takes us through all of the moving parts. Little review: the people, the migrate API, the code, the workspaces, our middleware. Uh, but we forgot about those orthogonal concepts. The, uh, the migrate API and incremental migrations aren't exactly playing well together, and also our workspaces. Uh, how does that work with the migrate API? So that's where we uh, developed a custom solution, which we called path-based migrations. Uh, custom module with config entities that also has migrate API hooks and event subscribers. Um, and this allowed us to filter the content as it's being migrated uh, down to whatever path prefixes we wanted to get. Also exclude some path prefixes at the same time. Uh, so that takes care of the migrate API question. Uh, and then at the same time, we're also going to associate the content with a workspace as we migrate it. There's the workspace integration. Um, so we would have this running in the background, you know, uh, on a cron task um, with Drush. And then when our migration managers were ready, they would go enable the path-based migration. Content would come over in a couple minutes. It'd be waiting for them in you know, the workspace in draft mode. They can go review it, looks good. Then they can send it out to the stakeholders. They review it, click publish on the workspace. Boom, you're done. Uh, you could use this technique with uh, a site that didn't use URLs that were structured slash as slash virtual directories. You'd have to name it something different, uh, so let us know if you do. The interface uh, was just Drupal. Looks like every other uh, Drupal admin form or, that you might have seen or list. Uh, we have a link to the workspace that's associated with the migration. Count of nodes. Uh, the configuration form is about as simple as you'd expect, allowed and denied or excluded path prefixes. Uh, as a content manager, you, uh, we talked already about the, uh, the proxy doing the, um, the middleware doing the proxying so that we could add this beautiful overlay for authenticated users. This is what happens when you uh, allow a backend developer to write CSS. <laughs> There was uh, not enough motivation to uh, change it, so we made it through the whole migration. <laughs> it worked. It worked. <laughs> it worked. Uh, it, otherwise, it would look like all of a sudden you were signed out because we made the site almost pixel perfect. Um, and so there needed to be some notification. You know, actually, you thought that section of the site was migrated, but it is not. Yet. Or you're not in the workspace that you thought you were in. Uh, okay, so that's communication. Uh, but the more important communication piece that we added uh, was a report of what is the status of our migration. So because we were breaking things down by path, uh, we just have a table where you know each section of the site starts out with the first slug in, in that URL path. Uh, here I've expanded the answers row so you can start to see some of the lower layers uh, within that URL, within that section. Uh, and this was a great communication tool so that everybody was on the same page, uh, you know, and it was both motivational, um, you know, and it helped with planning, right? Uh, when you have, you know, you think your next sprint, you're looking at which sections are we going to do next, um, how big are they, you know, how much content is in them. It was a good tool for that. Uh, so, okay, we have reached the end. Uh, this was a process and uh, tools that were built for people. Uh, we take things in small bites, we improve, and uh, we maintain a healthy team. Uh, which, of course, 
I know there's, there's questions coming, but I do want to say uh, thank you to all the other people that were involved in this. Um, you know, it wasn't just developers making the code. It took uh, a lot of courage from the security officer, <laughs> uh, the, um, you know, the, the content owners and the content managers, and, uh, everybody to get this done. So, okay. Uh, and with that, yes, I will take questions. Content freezes. Yeah. Are you doing like rolling content freezes? Is there a, some kind of panel similar to the one where you showed status that you put up saying this content types off limits this week or this today? Yeah, it, it was it was only by section of the site, um, and so our migration teams uh, set up you know communication channels with all of the stakeholders, of which there were many. Uh, there were some spreadsheets involved. Um, but it was a you know continuous communication exercise. Yep. There were a couple of sections of the site where we kept those content freezes down to, what, if I remember correctly, maybe four to six hours. Oh yeah, yeah. Some were very short. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I guess I have two questions. One is um, the forum showing the report showing the uh, progress. That's all integrated with Migrate API. And that's basically just showing the status of like the. Yeah, uh, for that actually we maintain, we reused the database connection for the Migrate API uh, for a custom uh, controller that we just wrote to, to okay. make sure. But I'm saying like, how, how do you feed, what kind of information are you feeding to it to determine the percentage? We went straight to the URL aliases. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, how many devs did it take? Yeah, so that's the, the other benefit of doing things incrementally. Uh, we had three back-end devs on this, I believe, uh, for most of the, the project, um, and we had a front-end dev as well. Yes? When you were thinking through Lano versus you know, the all-in-one approach, um, what were some of the risks that you were trying to avoid, or maybe that you had experienced in other migrations? Yeah, uh, the, the biggest risk was the number of stakeholders and trying to get everybody to approve it all at once. Um, and we also knew that we had a lot of legacy content that we wanted to change, um, but we didn't want to, you know, have to keep uh, re-migrating the site and keeping everything up to date, you know. Um, and so this allowed us to, you know, be like, okay, we're done with that, you know. Now we can focus on something else. Good job.